Hey everyone, <laughs> what's going on? Um, so, I'm Mike Del Sancio from uh, DC Farms, and I'm just gonna wait for a few people to log on. Sorry, the light's shining in my eyes. It's a nice day today, I'm sweating. Um, in case you're wondering what, uh, what the temperature, what the best temperature is for um, greenhouse growers. It's technically anywhere between like 25 during the day and about 16 to 18 at night. So it's good for the plants to um, have a break at night to recover just like us. So we were having those uh, nice, nicer days up until, well, this past week. Now it's kind of just hot during the day and hot at night. So it becomes a little more challenging to direct your plant, but we have other ways around that. Okay, well, I guess we'll enter. So I'm Mike from um, DC Farms, and um, this is my family's, um, I'm a third generation family farmer. Um, my parents have been farming this land since uh, the 70s. Um, we started off with uh, apple orchards, apple and peach orchards right here. And in 1995, we went to three acres of um, beefsteak tomatoes. We advanced to, into uh, horticulture and greenhouses because uh, acreage farming was um, getting a, a little challenging. So we had to shift and with the times. And um, that's what we've continued to do in 2012. We went uh, from another three acres to six acres. And we also grew um, Roma tomatoes and mini, cu mini cucumbers. And as you will see now, just this past year, I changed from cucumbers to eggplant. So I, I enjoy, um, one of the things I enjoy most about this job is learning new crops. And um, I'm enjoying eggplant so far. And I'll sh actually, we'll go and see that now. So, here's my entrance. I'm just gonna flip this around, actually. So when you come in, there's uh, farm biosecurity for um, COVID. We are following all of uh, Ministry of Labor and Health Canada standards. Anybody who comes in, first of all, we only allow um, emergency situations, whether it be an electrician or something where it's only, only extremely necessary. That's the only way we're letting anybody in. Um, but they are, I do check their um, health, go through a questionnaire, they put on a uh, robe, mask, gloves, and that's all in here, as you can see. Um, oh, and also, there's my beautiful parents. How, how sweet is that? Anyway, <laughs> they're, uh, they're the reason I'm here. I owe everything to them. And... Um, that's what uh, small family 300 horse uh, boilers, and that's good for about six to eight acres. So now we're, I'm taking you through uh, my greenhouse of eggplant. As you can see, this is um, three acres. We used to grow uh, mini cukes in this area but I've just changed the eggplant. Uh, by the way, if any of you um, do get into greenhouses, uh, in the horticulture field, getting one of these carts or a golf cart or something, I don't recommend it because once you have one, you, you're walking and your step count throughout the day drastically decreases and your pant size increases. Um, Madeline, I see you asked, has eggplant production become more popular in Ontario? Um, actually, it's kind of stayed um, fairly fairly consistent for the past few years. It's not, it's not the biggest market. The biggest market is definitely, um, the main commodities are cucumbers, tomatoes, and um, peppers. And now we're getting into uh, a lot of strawberries and lettuce. And um, eggplant is, it's on the smaller end of those markets. Uh, well, here we are. Oh, 
Sorry, everybody. <laughs> My bad. So, I'm doing this all on my own. I was gonna use a selfie stick, but I think that kind of looks a little, a little foolish, to be honest. Um, so here's my eggplant. Um, what essentially we're trying to do in the greenhouse is to create the perfect environment for photosynthesis to take place. And in simple terms, photosynthesis, photosynthesis takes the energy from the light and converts the water and CO2 into oxygen and sugars for the plant. And those sugars ultimately turn into the fruit you're looking at here. So in order to do that, we try to play God to some degree and put the perfect elements into, into the plant and into the environment and fine tune every little detail to get it to the optimal growth. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking to see if anyone has questions there. Um, so yeah, I'll show you. Can you see that? There we go. Um, so as you'll see down here, this is um, kind of like a glorified yeast draft that you have around your house. So when it rains, you know, it runs off, runs off your um, roof into the yeast draft and then it drains out the side. So all these plants, when we water, eventually they start draining and they drain into this and it goes to the end and it's all recaptured. So we keep everything on site and we're very environmentally friendly. Nothing from this facility ends up into the lake water or anything. We, uh, we have to abide by um, Ministry of Environment's regulations and we are audited quite often, and, um, but it's good because it keeps our industry moving forward and advancing. We always have to expect better from, uh, from one another in this industry and in life, to be honest. Um, so, oh, actually, I'll have to show you here. So when we feed the plants, we, oh, how many varieties of eggplant do you grow? Um, Diane, I have two varieties right now. Um, one is uh, J-Lo and one is Taurus. And um, I'm doing a trial to see, this is my first year growing it. So in order to figure out which one works best for me, I'm uh, doing a trial and collecting data. And um, that will determine how I proceed moving forward. So when, when we do water the plants, you see we have them on the uh, grow dance slabs there. So we can dictate how we grow the height of this slab depending on different watering measures you can water more or less and you can also adjust this to, um, to suit your needs you can go less here wider it's very custom fit to whatever you want and whatever kind of style works for you um, so we, when we get our plants we get them probably about a foot two feet tall and so we put them out on each individual slab, we have two, two plants. And as you'll see, with one block, we have two, two plants there. So it's four plants per bag. And these plants specifically are grafted. And that means we, we kind of cut the head off of one plant and put it onto another. The benefit of that is it gives us a stronger root zone. So kind of like, if you wanted faster feet to run, kind of cut your feet off and put on Usain Bolt's feet and you'll run faster. So that's kind of what we do here. And the benefit of that is in the long run, this plant will last longer. So we can get more production and longer production out of one initial planting. If I chose not to go that route, I would probably have to plant twice a year, which is an option as well. I'm. Uh, I'm still debating back and forth of which one's, which one's best for me. But as I collect data throughout the year, that answer will become more clear. So when we water, when we water, we have the irrigation line. It's running through the plant. And that's right there. So the water comes up and it feeds, feeds through 
through here, these little emitters. And these are set at a, per, at a certain pressure to open. So the pumps are set at a certain pressure to force these open. And then it goes through these, this uh, spaghetti. And uh, I'm not just saying that because it's Italian. I, don't, I actually don't know the term, but that's what I call it. And uh, this goes into the plant and it's staked down. You can see that. So there's a little hole, this hose, and it goes through there, hits this, hits this little break here, and then that's how we water our plants. Um, yes, uh, yes, there is a lot of uh, science and data collection and analysis in our day to day. It's um, it's becoming more and more. I, I'll show you something, um, kind of the newest thing that I'm working on. It's uh, it's pretty cool, but. Uh, I'll show you at the end of this when I'm back in my office. So, do you use these lines for nutrients? Yes, yes, these lines um, run all our water and our nutrients. Um, our nutrients are mixed. I, I recycle my water, first of all, I should get back to that. All the water that flows through is recycled and goes back to the front. And that is mixed and it's all sterilized to kill all the viruses and bacteria with the pasteurizer and then we mix it with fresh water essentially 50 50 mix of recycled and fresh nutrients and then we feed it back into the plant and that's how we're able to have a closed loop system and keep everything in-house and we save water save money on fertilizer every, everybody wins in that case um how many plants do i grow in my greenhouse i have uh Three acres here, three acres um, right on the other side of this wall, and it's roughly about 30,000 plants. And um, tomatoes, it's um, 40,000. It all depends on what you're growing and what kind of density you want. It's uh, the belief of having more plants equals more production, equals more money, equals a better business decision is it doesn't work that way. Some plants need more space, some plants need less space. Um, and what works in some greenhouses might not work in another. For instance, I have low plastic here. I have 14 feet, or sorry, yeah, no, 14 feet to the gutter and plastic. So that lets in less light than a, than a more high tech greenhouse, so to speak, with, which is like 24 feet and has glass. So they can get away with having more plants because simply they're allowed more light to penetrate their canopy. Um, yeah. So uh, also with crops, when I was growing cucumbers, that's a, that's a very quick crop. You kind of, you put it in and it's go, 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 go. Because it doesn't last. The plant's just not built to last. It's a very weak stem. It's um, just, it's a lot of water. So when you grow cucumbers, you have to grow, like some guys are doing four, five, even six crops a year. So it's just like continuous. And um, that has its advantages though. Um, now with eggplant, I'm doing one crop a year. Oh, excuse me. And I plant in um, February, first week of February. And I will take it to pretty much the start of December. And I find the time where my heating bill isn't as much as my profits. And once those kind of meet, that's when I decide to stop my crop. That's usually at the beginning of December. Um, and at that point also the plant has kind of, it's done. Like eventually these plants hit a point where they only have so much to give. And it's up to me to dictate when that is and plan the direction of my growing around that. There's lots of variables that play in this industry. Um, so I guess I will take you into my uh, tomato. Actually, wait. So in order for uh, pest control, this is this is an exciting part. Um, for pest control, we use bugs to uh, to eat bad bugs. I'm sure some of you know this, but for those of you who don't. So we put these little sachets out 
and they're full of they're full of little tiny bugs that you can't really see unless you're under a microscope or you have a, a little lens. And we put them in as you can see, it's one here, one here. You pretty much have one on every other plant, and I'm actually putting some in this afternoon. And that controls my pest. So this one, for instance, is Swirsky. This controls um, thrip for the most part. And I have other Californicus here that controls uh, spider mite. So you kind of, you play with which bugs work for you and also how many of these you put out. So if you anticipate a problem, and right now is probably the worst time. So we're, we're kind of good for pests up until uh, the summertime and the hot weather comes. And that's simply because it's hot and we have to, you can see, I have the vents open. So you can imagine how many, uh, I mean, it doesn't happen often, but bugs can just fly in at their leisure, you know, once you open a vent, kind of like your house, house flies come in when you leave the door open. So that's when, that's when we have um, pest issues. And um, I know there's, uh, there's always a concern that pesticides and the public wants clean fruit and vegetables. I, I completely agree. And we do not spray nearly as much as um, the public might might think. Um, there's no benefit in, a, in it for us. If we can control it with bios, it's economically better for us and every, every which way. So we really only try to spray when there is um, a very instant outbreak, kind of like, uh, well, COVID for instance, you saw how we had to like react quickly and take measures like that's kind of what happens to us like overnight you can just get hit um it doesn't happen often though and um, like i was saying um, we try to control as much with bios as possible and anytime we do spray we have to follow very strict protocols we have to take um, a course every three years for a grower pesticide safety course to know limits and residues and when we can pick how we can spray and uh, we definitely follow all the protocol to make it safe for us and the end consumer. Uh, okay, I'm going to open one of these now actually and show you. So, so inside this is just, you can see, where's the camera? It's just like, little dust sawdust with uh, bugs in there and they hatch periodically. So one of these lasts about three weeks. There's different stages of uh, larva and they come out, they come out over the course of three weeks to take care of pests. And I know you can't see them in, on there, but I do have, sorry here about all the movement. I do have, an example here of what it looks like. So I don't know if you can see those orange, those orange dots on there. Those are, those are the biologicals that we put in. Um, so anyway, that's the eggplant. I'm having a hard time knowing which way to put my phone. There we go. And um, here's our uh, Roma tomatoes. So I have three acres of uh, Roma tomatoes. And as you can see, I don't know if you can notice, but this is um, a much taller greenhouse. It's 21 feet. So the more space you have above the canopy, the more you can um, control, control humidity, temperature, um, all the key factors that go into it. So right now the average build is probably between 21 and 24 feet. Whereas that back range, the older grows that were in like the nineties and early two thousands, those were built um, at about 14 to 16 feet. Um, for um, insulation on our walls, I was saying previously, we have uh, plastic. So this is inflated plastic. So it insulates the two between the two layers. That's what, that's what keeps the cold air out. And there's new technology out now. And we just installed this last year. And it, it's uh, three layers of plastic. So 
it's that much more it's that much more insulation during the winter and that's very beneficial to keep our heating costs down um, so here we are in the tomatoes in the Roma tomatoes um, you can see walk backwards here um, these rows are about 312 feet and we pick our tomatoes um, these we pick this week it'll be twice a week next week it'll be three times a week so we pick every day except for Wednesday and Sunday that's what seems to work out best um, for us eight plants we pick every day and cucumbers we also uh, pick every day um, these likewise we planted these in uh, the start of September I, there we go um, Oh, sorry. <laughs> we started these on um, the start of um, February and we take them to uh, the end of November, beginning of December. Do you have any issues? Mercedes asked, do you have any issues with harsh winter conditions affecting or destroying your greenhouse? Um, yeah, the harsh, the harsh uh, winters um, can, can cause a problem. For the most part, these uh, structures are built fairly sound and strong enough to withstand um, most environmental conditions. However, there are, um, there are times where issues do arise. Sometimes a vent will stay open, on, uh, slightly open on a windy day. And you can just imagine the wind coming up and then peeling the vent back. I've never had it, but I've seen it and it doesn't look like fun. Um, but that being said, we do have um, all our alarm system and all the settings on our computer, we can set in advance to, for the environment and our settings to, uh, to react uh, before those conditions come. Uh, however, once in a while you do get a boiler shut down in the middle of winter. And that is probably the most challenging aspect of our job because it's, you know, whatever minus 15 outside and all of a sudden your boiler might shut down it sucks and you have to like it's like two in the morning and you have to like immediately like troubleshoot and come up with an answer or do something because you can just imagine the crop loss if this um this range dropped to you know freezing it would kill these plants like that and but that never it's never happened to me um, so in our tomatoes, we have, um, every week I take measurements, as you can see here, I take measurements of the growth. This is the growth from week to week. I flag it and I take measurements of the diameter of the stem, the length of the leaf and how many fruit is on per plant. And when you put all that data together, again, it's just more information to help you make better growing decisions. Um, uh, why are the stakes on an angle? Um, they're not, not technically on an angle. You don't want them on an angle. You want them straight up and down, just like that. Just like that. Sorry, okay, not, I'm not sure if you can see. Yeah, you don't want it like this because obviously if the water comes down, it's gonna hit this at this it's going to drop it's going to drop on the bag and not even water so you want it directly into the slab about halfway um yeah so this plant uh it starts off about two feet and it grows about a foot a week and i set about one this is a set one set a week so i'll pick a set and then i'll set another set on the top so it's just consistent and a week, a week's worth of growth, give or take. I mean, it's not always like that in the summer. It obviously grows more in the winter, not so much, but on an average, that's what it is. And so I get about 36, 37 sets a year. So that times a foot each. So if you do quick math at the end of the year, my, my plant is like 36, 37 feet. So this plant right here, you know, would end way down there so it's pretty cool it's pretty cool that um, watching these things 
grow and go through different life cycles throughout the whole year. Like that's my, that's my, one of my favorite parts of, of growing. Um, to support our, our plants, you see, we put these, um, these black, they're called accordions on there. So that prevents them from kinking, making a sharp kink in there. And that allows you to get full growth out of your plant. And, oh, sorry, my bad, I meant branches. They all look like they are on an angle easier. Oh, I see what you're asking. Oh, Luciano. So why it's like, why it's going like this. Um, yeah, that's probably something I should have mentioned. So we lower these plants. So this plant, like this plant right here, this plant right here is probably about, right now it's like 16 feet long. So it goes that way. So this, this row onto my left is tilted that way. And this, this row is tilted forward. And that's when they grow, we lower the, I don't know if you can see those hooks up there. They're on string and we lower them. Once a week, we lower them and allow us to grow more in the canopy space above. Um, with our tomatoes, we have a grafted and a pinched plant. So we have two plants. We have two plants here with one rootstock. So you can see it's kind of two for the price of one within one block. That looks like it's not good for the plant, but it eventually dries up and it's, it's not too much of an issue moving forward. Um, also another key thing is the size of the fruit. So these tomatoes right here, you'll see, I want um, very consistent size for the pack because if you don't have consistency and it's all over the place, it, uh, it doesn't look good to the end consumer and uh, it's not desirable to our, to our um, marketer. I can uh, show you what the end product looks like. So right now I have it, it's about 22 degrees in here right now. And I hit my peak, I keep it at about 24 and it'll hit 24 in about an hour at like lunch. And then I go down to at nighttime, I drop it down to capture, to capture the, the cold. Cause when you get that deep pre-night, it, uh, it forces the sugars up to the head. So at night, like right when, the, right when the sun's setting, I try to drop my temperature to like 16 and that forces sugars into the head and that can give you, it forces growth, uh, growth, <laughs> forces fruit growth. I combined two words into one. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna take you uh, up to the front. Hope I don't have uh, Austin Powers moment here. Um, Kenny is asking, explain the importance of joules. Okay, so joules is um, measuring the amount of energy from the sun. So how much, how much you're getting from the sun. And that dictates how, how hot you want to keep your crop and what direction you want to um, steer your crop. So on hot days like this, I can get away with um, a much higher temperature. If it was a cloudy kind of rainy day, like we had like, a couple weeks ago, I would keep it much lower. I would keep it probably like 20. And you don't want to push a plant when you have when you don't have optimal weather. So on cloudy, rainy days, you kind of just give the plant a bare minimum so you don't burn it out. A plant, much like a human, it only has so much. So you wanna push it at its proper time or else it's just not gonna cooperate. Um, so we're just driving up to the front. When I, anytime I drive through, or I'm pretty much all hours of the time I'm in here, my ears and eyes always have to be open because you, you have to listen to pumps, uh, boilers, uh, CO2, uh, vents, uh, everything, everything. You have to be like a music producer 
and just understand where sounds are coming from and why they're there. Um, that's just part of the nature of the job. And that's something that they, you can't really learn that in school. It's, um, it's just something that comes with experience. And that's kind of, that's why a grower's position is so, it's so valuable and it's so important because they can just, they just know everything that's going on or should know everything. I'm not claiming to know everything, despite what my wife might think. <laughs> um, so this is my newest, uh, my newest toy and I'm, I'm super excited about it. So it's uh, a pasteurizer unit. So this is what I was talking about when I said um, we recycle our, our water. Um, when the water comes back, when it drains into that yeast trough and it comes back, it's held in these large storage tanks behind me. And then it passes through those storage tanks, through this unit. And this unit heats up the water to 90 degrees and kills anything harmful for the plant within that. And then it's mixed into another one of those black tanks. Those are 10,000 gallon tanks. And it's mixed with the fresh water and my new nutrients and fired right back into my crop to, uh, to water. So it keeps my fertilizer cost down, my water cost down, and any potential uh, harmful residues to the environment all on house, all in house. Um, okay, I am going to show you um, my fertilizer and my injector unit. So, so here we are. This is uh, this is my uh, fertilizer tanks. So as you can see, we got uh, calcium, Epsom salt, magnesium sulfate, potassium nitrate, and uh, so I mix these periodically, as you can see. So I mix those about I don't know on average once a week. And um, so that is mixed with the recycling water that I was just mentioning. And I use this injector system here. Oh, just kicked on. Wow, that was like perfect timing. Um, so you can see, see how these uh, injector heads, you'll see it go. See, see how it just pumped? So that's pumping all my fertilizer and mixing it with my recycled into my crop. And that ties into the joules that I was discussing earlier, because based on how many joules, that ba that's based on how much you water. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna show you one, one thing here that I forgot about. Just our end product. So, this is our end product. This is uh, it's two pounds, and it ends up going to um, our stuff specifically goes to Costco. And the packaging is very important to keep the shelf life. And you can see how size and consistency is so important. Right now, I'm shooting for like anywhere between 95 and 105 grams per fruit. And that keeps a very consistent, nice looking pack. And um, here's my eggplant. It's about five in a bag. And uh, there's a lot of science behind that bag. They have to have environmental controls kind of built into the plastic. I don't know. I don't know all the, how it all works, but um, you have to keep the humidity out of the bag. And they do that with certain kinds of plastic I've been told. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I'm gonna take you now to see my, uh, my computer and how I uh, operate this place. So here's my office. Well, here's what I, uh, that's pretty much it. 
that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, so here we're in my office. Um, here's my, uh, so when I scout for bugs, I'll grab a leaf and I will look at it up close to see uh, what kind of bugs, how many bugs we have, uh, the beneficials that are there, are the beneficials working. Um, I just I just started using um, this like a few years ago and my scouting game has gone up tenfold. So if any of you are interested in getting into scouting, I highly recommend uh, you get yourself a microscope. Um, what is a difficult process? Was a difficult process to get your products in Costco? Um, actually, it's not. Um, we ship our stuff to uh, a marketer and um, they, um, they build the relationships with Costco and uh, the grocery stores and it's up to them um, where they send it. I don't have, um, I do have some say in it, but ultimately it's up to um, the marketer on where they want to ship our produce. And which is one of the reasons why the Leamington Kingsville area is um, so high in greenhouse um, acreage because we're close to uh, the Detroit border and the American border. And that's the busiest, uh, that's the busiest border crossing in all of, um, all of Canada state's um, area. So it makes sense that, that we would have a large uh, segment of the horticulture greenhouse industry within close proximity. Uh, okay, so here's my, uh... oh, whoa. I never realized <laughs> I've been talking for a while. Um, I'm just going to go quickly here. Here's my uh, computer. This is my system. And um, so you can see everything's controlled by here. I got temperature, relative humidity, humidity deficit, CO2. See, that's low. I want my CO2 at 400. Vents. And then I, uh, I check out my graph. That pretty much dictates everything I want. And... Um, guess that's it I've been talking for a long time um, <laughs> I guess thank you guys for um, um, for having me and um, for anybody who's looking to uh, get into this industry I highly encourage you I know there's not a lot of um, farming is not exactly seen as like a young man's game so to speak um, but it can be um, I'm trying to um, my major reason for getting into this industry is I love working with my family and having them around and I'm going to be a father shortly in like three months and I love the idea of having um, my son like come to work with me and not too many professions allow you that. Um, and I also, um, I love that it makes me, it forces me to be versatile and it forces growth. So, I mean, that just... I could take that from here into the outside world and I'm, I feel prepared for anything because you have to be prepared for anything as a greenhouse operator. And um, so, but if you are coming, I suggest, and well, this wasn't planned, but I'm a big fan of uh, Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris. And uh, <laughs> Bruce Lee's uh, whole philosophy is kind of like taking, taking everything of what you know and putting it to use in your own style, not being so like, closed off to other ways of thinking and if you want to be a greenhouse grower that's that's kind of what it boils down to you don't um, there's many ways to do it many ways that work many different opinions and you just want to find out what works best for you um, so with that being said this is um, DC farms uh, I'd like to to say we are a small family farm that's my passion I feel like that's a very fundamental core of what makes us human like that's how humans started with farms you know and as much as as much as this industry is going to big business and corporate i understand there's a need for that but there's there's always a need for small family farmers and i'm I, i'm keeping up with the times i plan on um, a small cannabis expansion in the front in the front of my greenhouse here. And I like that I can show that um, I can adapt and grow. And that's what farming is all about. And I encourage you, 
young people to get into it. And if you have any questions, reach out. 